Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for um, our ACT NOCTI online seminar, your first year in CTE expert session. Um, I greatly appreciate your patience, and thank you for everyone who's joining us today for this live online seminar. So without further ado, let's get things rolling, and I'll start off with um, some introductions about who we're going to um, be talking with today. Um, so the first is Michael Conant from ACTE, and then we go straight into our uh, NOCTI lineup with John Foster, NOCTI President and CEO, uh, Pam Foster, Education Consultant, Clyde Hornberger, NOCTI board, board Member, and Kathleen McNally, the School Improvement Specialist. So I know they're probably going to talk a little bit more about their positions, and I'll let them uh, kickstart this in just a second. Um, but first, we're actually going to be starting with Michael Conant from ACTE, who's here with me today in the office. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm so appreciative of you taking the time to join us and join our partners at NACTI. This is a particularly exciting program for us. Started uh, about two years ago when uh, Dr. Foster's, uh, both John and Pam, and uh, ACTE sat down to take a look at what was really being said out throughout the CTE community, particularly as our faculty are increasingly coming from outside traditional uh, educator prep programs. And so uh, John and Pam and Clyde and Sandy and, and others who have been involved in contributing and, and writing these publications have really uh, locked on an important set of resources and an approach that we're hearing has tremendous value out throughout the CTE uh, community. What we'd like to do today is just share some general thoughts about this approach. Um, certainly having the authors here and, and their thinking that sits behind uh, these publications is of, of real value. And then answer questions you might have about how uh, the messages contained and in information you'll find in these publications uh, can work for you in helping to support your new teachers to be as successful as possible. With that, uh, turn it over to Dr. John Foster. Hi, everybody. Um, this is John, and uh, I wanted to talk to you just for a minute about um, the, what we see as far as uh, this book's audience. Essentially, these books were written for alternatively certified career and technical education uh, teachers. Um, it's been our experience over the years and from talking to lots and lots of folks, and of course, uh, from our experience at NOPI, where we, we still supply teacher certification tests for roughly I don't know, 20 states across the United States for alternative teacher certification programs. Um, from, from that context and that background, we really felt that uh, we're in a bit of a crisis with teacher education for career and technical education. And uh, that's pretty easy to spot because there's been a number of organizations that have written reports about it. Uh, the uh, National Research Center for Career and Technical Education, for example, uh, SREB, for example, and in fact, uh, we've, we've put a piece or two together uh, via white papers and blog posts. But uh, we also noticed that there are, you know, few and fewer uh, teacher tests, teacher certification tests uh, actually being, you know, sold from our entity. But <clears throat> what I wanted to talk about, um, aside from the need, was the fact that CTE teachers who come in from an alternative certification mechanism are really a special breed. Um, you know, when you think about it, if you're the top welder in your field or the top nurse in your field and you've decided that you want to have an impact on education and you want to show others the, the beauty of your craft and you make a job transition, you're really leaving kind of the top of your field and moving into a brand new field where you're actually back down on the bottom. So you're taking your content expertise from one field and applying it to another but you're kind of starting a career change and, and you're making that career change from scratch. So it, it does take a, a certain commitment. Not only do you want to work with kids, do you want to share the excitement of your craft, but it, it takes a, a, a commitment to be able to become an alternative CTE teacher, an alternatively certified CTE teacher. So that's the target for the, uh, the, the books that we were working on with, with ACTE. So, um, the book series uh, is uh, kind of in process right now. Book one has been available for about a year or so. Book two 
um, has come out relatively recently, and we're currently working on uh, the final book, book three. But the idea is book one is all about uh, relationship establishment and, and that sort of thing. And it was really written for teachers with no experience in the classroom, somewhere in the vicinity of the first three months on the job. Book two was about tools and things like that that you can use, and it was really written for the teacher who's pretty much survived their first year, and um, they're starting to move into some of the craft of teaching and, and a, being, a, being a real professional educator. Um, things like lesson plan development and uh, uh, assessment of students and, and those sorts of issues, um, more nitty-gritty kind of tool issues. And the last book uh, that we're working on is really about uh, leadership and becoming a professional within your community and the greater community of your state or your, uh, of your nation, actually. Um, it's written for the teacher who's been in place for about three years and um, has really taken up the mantle of becoming a teacher. And now it's up to them to continue that role model uh, position and model what things CTE can do for their local community and uh, state and the nation. The other thing I want to mention is that the, uh, the book layout is pretty much the same. Um, we've tried to make this thing fun. We've tried to make it a handbook style. And we've tried to make it helpful. So each chapter in each of the books is broken down into basically three sections. And they're easy to read. They're kind of lighthearted. But we, we hope that they provide significant content to, uh, to help new teachers, again, particularly those who are coming in from outside the field of education without a, uh, a bachelor's degree in, in education. So the chapters are laid out by content. Typically, there's you know four or five, six pages of content per chapter. There's case studies included. And for those of you on the, uh, the webinar that have helped us with those case studies, thank you. I, I did have a chance to take a look at the list, and I know there are a few folks out there who who have helped, who are on this call. Uh, so I would have, want to make sure that I send out a, uh, a thank you for those folks. Um, there are also key learnings in the chapter. And lastly, uh, there are additional resources provided uh, as well. So I'm going to actually have each one of the authors talk about um, what they've done, uh, one chapter in each of the books. And I'm going to start with uh, Pam Foster. And she's actually going to talk to you about a section that uh, she's familiar with in uh, book one. So, Pam, go ahead and take it away. Hello, everybody. Um, yes, as John said, my focus is going to be one chapter out of book one, and that's to really focus more on initial relationships with students and establishing important professional bounds, again, especially for that um, new CTE teacher within the first three months. So the one that I uh, have chosen, it has to do with the support system and mentoring. So it was actually chapter three from book one, and it's who's got your back. And just to kind of summarize briefly on that, we believe that there's like two major groups that will help a new teacher. Um, of course, you have the non-school associated one, which is going to be family and friends, and they're very important. But then you have the school associated group, and we kind of break that down into three subgroups, I guess you would say. You have the one that's inside the school, and that would be more those that are in the supervisory role. For example, your directors, principals, supervisors, kind of more of a boss to employee relationship. Uh, another group would be those who provide content expertise, especially members of your occupational advisory committee. And then the group that kind of helps you find a balance would be more of the peers, mentors, other teachers, um, perhaps instructional support communities, and maybe even professional associations there. They kind of serve as a sounding board for instructional ideas. So these could be inside and outside of school. Let me give you maybe an experience from the field that we had cited in book one. Um, the real big concern here is that there's too many new career tech ed teachers that are leaving teaching within the first three to four years and returning to industry. And this is a real problem throughout the country. Uh, many have left because they felt overwhelmed or undersupported. And so to try to reduce this dropout for new CTE teachers in California, they developed a program called Teacher Induction 
program known as TIP. And it was a two-year program. It was led by experienced teachers in a role of mentoring new CTE teachers and also providing veterans for additional support. Um, it included workshops, trainings, weekly classroom visits, and observations. And what they found out was after uh, the development of this program and its implementation, there is a big decrease in dropout of new CTE teachers. And the really additional benefit was that classroom instruction improved significantly. So the students were benefiting as well. The program TIP was so successful that they expanded it statewide and they renamed it CTE Teach. And the four main goals obviously were to increase teacher retention, to improve teacher training, to enhance teacher effectiveness, and also to advance student learning. And so not only did they find out that the new CTE teachers were surviving, but they were thriving. And one of the most important factors was face time with the mentee, because sometimes situations show up, and if you can have that person right there to immediately observe or provide um, feedback, it's better than having to wait till maybe at the end of the day. So if we look at slide 10, um, there's some key points here, and I'm not gonna read those. You can look over those, but I found that a really good resource article is entitled, A Successful Induction into the Teaching Profession. And it's written by Lori Cochran and Susan Reese. And it's a Missouri example from 2007. So a successful induction into the teaching profession by Cochran and Reese. And as John had mentioned earlier, we do have resources available at the end of the chapter. So that's just a, a brief part of chapter three from book one. I'm gonna turn things over now to Kathleen McNally. Hey, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, Please let me know if you can, throw something in the chat box, but I wanted to first start out and say, if I may, how excited I am to be part of this initiative because John is right when he said, we open up and say CTE teachers are a special breed, certainly are, because they bring so much to uh, a student's experience, a learning experience, and so I'm absolutely thrilled to be involved in that community. So. I have the uh, exciting pleasure to be involved in the writing of the books, and as we alluded to, book one is about those relationships, and Pam was talking about uh, different initiatives out there that really help with that. So we move on to book two, 10 more things to know, and I kind of laugh at those titles because as a new CTE teacher, you're you're probably thinking, if you are one, you're probably, or work with them, you're thinking, how could you boil it down to 10? Because there's so much to know. You're absolutely right. So, but we really wanted to make these kind of like handbooks. And this one is all about tools, tools, techniques, strategies. And anybody coming from industry realizes how important your set of tools are for any one of your industries. And so there's a set of tools that are good for teaching. And so you can get a sense on the screen, it shows you the different topics for this book, um, anywhere from connecting with parents and how do you really leverage a good advisory committee, which is essential for good programs, to really understanding how do you plan? How do you plan your work? And how does that help students in the long run? So um, I wanted to dive in a little deeper into one of the chapters that is near and dear to my heart and Red Coats, and that is uh, career technical student organizations. So as a new CTE teacher, you have to make decisions on where you spend your time and what you connect with. What I would love to champion for you, if you are one of those new teachers and you're trying to figure out what's what, please trust me on this one, that CTSOs are a, a beautiful complement to what you do. It's a, it, they bring a positive network for both teachers and students. So you may know of some, um, Skills USA is a big one for trade and industrial students. There's uh, HOSA for health occupation students. We have DECA, FBLA, you name it, FFA for the agricultural industries. So these organizations are 
are there, they're sponsored, they're supported by our government, they're a beautiful partner for what you do in the classroom. And so this chapter really looks at, well, how can you tap those organizations or how as a teacher and, an, and a now an advisor, how can you use those organizations and their, their platforms, their programs of work? like helping students become leaders and benchmarking through competition. How do those things relate to what you're doing in the classroom and how do they enhance what you're doing in the classroom? And there's just so many opportunities for that. So um, it, I was thrilled to be able to include that in the book. So slide 13, I think, shows us a little bit of that flavor. If I may, am I allowed to do that? There we go. So here are some key learnings about that. So if you think about, do I invest time in becoming an advisor? Do I invest time by engaging my students at a technical student organization? The answer is yes. <laughs> so they're so value added. They uh, help students to figure out, well, how do I make decisions? And how do I organize people? How do I work with people I don't know? And all of those skills and learnings and understanding do nothing but raise the quality of the experience that they have with you in your technical teaching in your technical lab. Um, competitive events are a huge part of CTSOs. They're probably the most well-known aspect, and those things just uh, allow students to shine, to benchmark, to set goals. And if you've been at all involved or will be involved, I guarantee it, when you see it change a student's life, you're hooked. It's a great professional network for you as well as a, as, as a teacher. I've never met more committed, positive people about student success as I have through these networks. So um, I encourage that. I'm thrilled that it was part of the book. Book two is just a great, um, you know, kind of culmination of, of strategies and tools. So I'd love to turn it over now to another aspect from book number two about advisory committees to my colleague, Klein Horn. Excuse me, Clyde Hornberger. Clyde? Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning I want to talk to you about Chapter 9, which is connecting with uh, occupational advisory committees. Obviously, you have some points in front of you on the screen, but I just want to begin by saying the very core of what we do in current technical education is based upon expert advice from business and industry. Occupational advisory committees are unique to current technical education, and actually from the very beginning and early times of current technical education, they are the common to every CTE program or current technical program throughout the country. Unfortunately, they are often, uh, they become routine or underutilized and somewhat ineffective. And sometimes they're held just to satisfy the core requirements. Some Current technical teachers uh, hold obligatory meetings once or twice a year, spending much of their time uh, giving a school and program update on uh, their accomplishments, et cetera, to their advisory committee members. The updates are important, but current technical education teachers need to engage occupational advisory committee members in their curriculum and equipment needs. They need to involve them in facility design and the delivery of instruction. They need their help in analyzing performance data and developing plans for program improvement. The book provides strategies for con uh, conducting meetings and for engaging uh, occupational advisory committee members. As one example, uh, you know, many schools throughout the country conduct large one-night uh, advisory committee meetings for the entire school, all the current technical programs. And they typically begin with introductory remarks and then overviews of the school and all the progress that the school's doing, et cetera. And then, then they break out into their individual program meetings and sometimes there's just not enough time or administrator coverage to be able to deal with the issues that come up with those individual meetings. The book suggests that, you know, sometimes cluster meetings or in a one evening for certain programs may be just a a more appropriate way to deal with uh, the concerns of advisory committee members. The book also provides uh, some toolkits and uh, some references that are very helpful for conducting OAC meetings. The next slide, well, somebody advanced that, it's not advancing for me. There it is, the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> 
provides, again, some more information about advisory committees. Obviously, occupational advisory committees are important to the quality of current technical education programs. Occupational advisory committee members must possess mastery level subject matter expertise. Quality members focusing on the quality measures of student performance and programs results in high quality current technical programs. Typically, there are two tiers in most schools. That the top tier advisory committee is a school level committee that is composed of uh, community leaders, business education, workforce development board, economic development folks, and government leaders that help guide the current technical leaders in strategic issues such as funding and future programming. Again, the occupational advisory committee brings more relevance to what we do in the classroom and in the lab. But sometimes teachers are asked to serve on the local advisor or the, the higher level tier committee as well. The book references personal contact being one way to engage business and industry people. So when we say <clears throat> conduct personal contact and recognize and engage occupational advisor committee develops ownerships among the current technical programs among the advisory committees. So in other words, once we recognize people who are contributing their expertise, and engage them in strategies to help provide awards for students or special recognition, the members tend to take ownership of the program and become more and more engaged. It's important for the teacher to make that personal. Do OAC, meet, OAC meetings and employers and time and advice add value to their program? It is important for teachers and school leaders to evaluate the effectiveness of their occupational advisory committee meetings. This should be done minimum of annually, and it should be done in any case anonymously that OAC members can comment, have I really provided the kind of input? Has my time been worth my return on my investment? The next slide really goes back to what John was talking about was book three. You know, as teachers, uh, Current technical education teachers enhance their skills and grow as professionals. They need to add and contribute to the profession by becoming a mentor to new teachers, by becoming a teacher leader, and helping all teachers improve as professionals. As professionals, they need to become advocates and continue to advocate for students in current technical education at the local, state, and national levels. They need to learn and lead about issues and advance the profession. Book three will help teachers, teacher leaders, build and expand their relationships and develop expertise in current and future trends that affect current technical education and the broader profession of education. Uh, now I'd like to return back to John to make some further comments about book three. Yeah, thanks a lot, Clyde. You know, you've heard the expression, uh, you know, building the plane while it's flying. Well, I get to describe the building of the plane while it's flying. We're currently uh, writing uh, book three. So um, what I'm about to tell you is uh, a, a little bit, uh, like I said, like, um, you know, building the plane while you're flying it. Uh, but we've kind of broken book three into kind of um, three kind of chunks, I guess, if you will. Um, chunk one is uh, your national and state community. Another section is your uh, local community. And then the, the last kind of chunk is your, um, your classroom community. So we've kind of taken it from very, very large scale down to you know, very, uh, very small scale. So the idea is that in this third year of your educational experience or fourth year, um, depending on you know, where you are and how you've come through the program, you're going to acquire more and more skills and people will tend to look up to you as a role model, not only your students, but um, people in your school, people in your community, maybe even people in your state or in the nation. Uh, you might become a teacher of the year or state teacher of the year or something like that. And we feel there are things that you should know that uh, we want to incorporate in this book. For example, on a national level, um, you know, we should be able to talk about um, your impact at your local level on, uh, you know, legislation and, and how legislation affects your, your classroom. 
how accountability issues affect your classroom. You should have some sense of, of how that works. Uh, on a state level, you know, what, what initiatives are going on in your state um, that, um, you know, maybe there's a statewide articulation agreement um, where your students can obtain college credit. Maybe there's a dual credit agreement. All those kinds of things deal with awareness. They're not things that you need to know the first day or maybe even the first year, but they are things that you need to be aware of because all of those kinds of things will help you be a better mentor to your students and help you advocate for your students. And then when you start to think about your, your local community, you know, with, with you having expertise in a particular craft or a particular occupation, you can share that craft. I mean, maybe there's something you could do at your local library to talk about, um, you know, healthcare issues or how to prevent uh, getting a cold, or maybe you can help the Cub Scouts or the Boy Scouts uh, learn some basic construction skills in, in birdhouse building or, or something like that. There's all kinds of opportunities where you can not only advocate for career and technical education, display your own skills, but also elevate yourself as a role model and a leader um, within your community. So that's kind of the focus of, of book three. Um, we, we really anticipate this one to, uh, you know, to, to focus on, you know, building the community. You know, I, I tell the story when I was uh, becoming a career and technical education teacher, one of the things that was emphasized to me was the, uh, you know, the, the emphasis on joining committees that may impact what it is that we do. Uh, for example, ACTE, uh, you know, who sponsored, of course, this webinar, we were kind of um, told uh, as new CTE teachers that ACT was your organization and you really ought to play a part in that. You should join, obviously, but you should also try to take on a leadership role, um, maybe be a state leader, those kinds of things. There are uh, administrators organizations in your in your state possibly that you could join. There are state organizations. Um, those kinds of things are really important to developing a community and, and making sure that community has sustainability. So that's the kind of focus uh, that, that book three will be, uh, will be on. And we're hoping, by the way, to uh, have that available or at least, um, uh, at least final copies um, around Vision 2016. So, so be looking for that uh, when we get closer to uh, our Visions Conference in, uh, in November. So I'm going to pass the ball back to uh, ACTE and uh, ask them to talk about uh, other resources that um, they can provide in terms of teacher preparation and helping the new teacher. Thank you, John, and, and certainly uh, Clyde and, and Catherine and Pam. Uh, it's been a great overview, I think, of the content and the themes you're striking in the uh, books we put together. Um, on the, the next slide, you're going to see several other resources that we currently have available. Um, I just want to emphasize that these are all available online at the ACTE website. That address is ACTE online, all one word, dot org. And then on the home page, you can select Shop ACTE, or you can use that just as a URL, acteonline.org and then backslash shop ACTE. These two publications that you're seeing here, building, uh, I'm sorry, putting your data to work, improving instruction in CTE, also in partnership with uh, folks from NACD, particularly uh, uh, the authors you see there on the uh, publication, and then a prior offering that we've continued to see a lot of interest in, a, um, a very easy read again called Building Advisory Boards That Matter, uh, but very, very uh, comprehensive in terms of a blueprint on how to make those occupational advisory uh, committees that Clyde talked about come to life. Um, I will also just point out that we worked with the authors to keep these as reasonably priced and uh, fairly straightforward publications so that you can put the information in them to work immediately. I think that's the, uh, the final thing I'd say about all four of these publications, the two books for in the 10 Things to Know series, Putting Your Data to Work and Building Advisory Boards, is that they really are intended for that classroom teacher who would be new in the CTE environment to have sitting on or in their desk 
easy to access when they have questions. Uh, the first book has a, a, a number of glossary terms. The second book has a number of tips and, and recommendations. Uh, they all contain real practical advice. The third element that you're seeing on the screen is our latest activity that we're pretty excited about. And that is the professional networking throughout the CTE community. And we began a project last year to spin up a private community of practice for ACTE members. Later this spring, or I should say early this spring, we'll be opening this community up to our entire membership at no additional cost. We're excited because it's in this space that a number of those member-only benefits that we're currently providing on our HD online site will be uh, presented here in a seamless and I think easy to use interface. Along with that comes the capability to network, discuss, share, and collaborate. And so please stay tuned for news of the core community coming to you as an HD member. I'm going to turn it back to Celia for some final comments uh, pulled out to our, our uh, uh, participants today. Uh, I know we're going to do some Q&A, but I really want to thank all of you for being on the call. I suspect a number of you are coordinators or administrators or having been in the classroom for a while, curious as to what these publications actually might be able to do to help you in your classroom environment or in your school or CTE center. And the bottom line is it is a community. And by being able to share your expertise, and leverage the information in these publications is where we hope to advance high quality CTE. With that, I'll turn it back to Celia. Hello everyone. Um, so thank you again for everyone for joining us. And now it is the Q&A. If you have a question, please use the Q&A or the chat box to ask your question. So John. Okay. Uh, I, I'm sorry, everybody. I know there was quite a bit of chaos. And that uh, was, we didn't, we weren't able to hear the answer to your first question, unfortunately. This will all be removed from the recording, but if I could just ask you to read the question one more time and have provide your answer for it, we can start from there and take the questions and answers. Sure, be happy to. Uh, the question reads, uh, assessment data can be confusing to understand sometimes. How much detail do these books provide on suggestions for the most appropriate time and training individuals on how to interpret and use assessment scores? And that question comes to us from uh, Todd Luke. So Todd, thank you for your question. And, and basically, uh, yes, uh, book two does provide two chapters uh, on assessment data. The uh, first chapter, and I forget which number it actually is, but uh, it talks about terminology that new teachers should be aware of when it comes to assessment. This is both formative and summative uh, sorts of data. And then the second chapter in that particular book talks about data uh, that you receive from an assessment and how to do a, a minor item analysis and how to use that data for uh, instructional improvement. You know, if, if you're in a position where you're receiving pre-test and post-test information, um, the example that I mentioned uh, was maybe you're in a construction-related occupation and uh, you notice that one of the key areas, one of the standard areas within that occupation is your ability to read blueprints. And you note that there wasn't uh, considerable advancement from the pretest to the post-test in blueprint reading. Well, that indicates that you as the teacher uh, may have an area that you want to take a look at. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong or incorrect with your instructional ability. What it does mean, though, is that you, need, you may need some additional instructional tools to help your students understand that particular standard area. Maybe uh, you need some instructional media. Maybe your students need additional practice time. Maybe they need some online instruction. There's all sorts of reasons for um, a score not necessarily improving. Um, but what it does do is it, it, it asks you to focus on the data. And without the data, you, of course, can't uh, continuously improve your instruction, which is you know, what all of us want to do. So again, thanks, Todd, for the question, and uh, that information is in book two. Perfect. Thank you so much, John, for that response, and I apologize to everyone on the call that had to go through those minutes of pure chaos. <laughs> but thank you for everyone who is with us. And we have another question here. Um, 
So this is discussing the books, and this one question in particular was looking at CTSOs. And it can be pretty difficult putting together your chapter of a CTSO. Um, is, are there, is there a lot of information in the book series about CTSO collaboration and really starting that up in your school? I'd, I'd kind of like Kathleen to address that one, so if she could come off mute, that would be great. Uh, but that information uh, about CTSOs is also in book two uh, in the beginning stages. Yeah, hi there. Hopefully you can hear me. So if I heard the question correctly, um, it was about if there was information for CTE teachers in terms of guiding them to start a chapter. Does that sound correct? Like what that all entails? Yes, and really starting, you know, working with CTSOs and starting that up in your school. Yes, yes. So um, Zahn is right. So there's a whole chapter dedicated in book two to the idea of that, of how do you really embrace CTSOs? How do they become a part of your world? And, and how do those, and how do the CTSO um, sort of experiences and opportunities interface and relate to what you're doing um, in the classroom? And how does that become part of your classroom technique? So uh, forgive me, I don't remember the, name, the number of the chapter, but in book two, that's there. Keeping in mind, though, that this is a handbook. So our goal was to really try to boil down the things that are most important. So that chapter has um, an outline of, for example, kind of the key um, experiences that are great to start with. So I think that it's kind of a handbook um, approach, which I love. And so a new CTE teacher can say, okay, what do I do? How do I start? So for example, the idea of, well, let's think about having some officers. Like how do you set up your students in a structure so that they can then help you bring that to life? So one of those first pieces is how do you elect officers? What sort of positions would you need? How do you get them together for a meeting? So those are the types of things that are in that chapter. And so I'm uh, really hoping that that's one of those great uh, sort of resources to guide folks. And as, as we had stated, every chapter in book one and two have additional resources at the end. So there are some great websites that have for particular to the specific CTSOs that folks can get to for more information. So I hope that helps a little bit, just coloring what's there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I really appreciate your feedback about CTSOs. Um, another question we have lined up, just this and go out to all the panelists and get your feedback on this. Um, which program area of CT has the most difficulty retaining teachers? And this can be your individual experience, um, whether um, writing the book, getting the information together, and what you would thought about that. I guess I can I can take that one, take a stab at it anyway, and you know we can ask the other authors to uh, to jump in. I, I I think this really varies by area, but um, you know. <laughs> Moving to career and technical education uh, and, you know, possessing the dedication to become a CTE teacher is really an individual choice. Uh, you know, it's something that some folks, you know, find later in life, so they typically have, you know, experiences. Um, they're not the typical bachelor's degree student in uh, a typical area uh, like a, a math or an English where the student uh, becomes a teacher at the, uh, you know, in, in their 20s. These folks are typically a bit older and uh, typically have lots more experience. And, and I guess the areas that have the most difficulty uh, in terms of retention are those where the transition is greatest. Um, and, and so that really is kind of a, kind of a soft answer. But, um, you know, when you think about um, making the transition from, a, you know, a, a, maybe a, a CCIO, a chief information officer, back into a classroom where you're beginning with students who are new recruits, who have base information, it makes your job all the more difficult because there's such a gap in um, your experience and theirs, and it's a gap that you as an individual have to want to fill. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to, you know, um, tag any particular cluster uh, with, you know, more ability or having you know, a greater uh, retention problem than any other. It really comes down to uh, individual issues, but we do find that 
you know, the greater the transition between experience levels, then, you know, sometimes the more um, frustrating experience can come and, and therefore the greater need for mentors to help people get through this thing. Um, like, uh, like Pam had mentioned, the, uh, the CTE Teach program in California is a great example of uh, mentorship. And there's lots of other ones across the state that just happens to be one that we highlighted. So thanks for the question. Okay. If I could just add something to what John has said, that um, it is kind of hard to determine where it would be more difficult to try to find uh, mentors for, for various, what areas would it be of CTE, but um, sometimes in the um, career tech ed setting, you might have like two culinary teachers, so they could kind of help each other out. Um, something like that, but I know with experience that I had recently with a precision machine technology teacher that he was the only one in the system and they feel again kind of isolated. So a suggestion that I might make is to reach out to another career technical school and try to find somebody who is teaching the same subject such as precision machine technology. So at least by phone or um, email so that that new teacher can reach out to that person as kind of walked their walk and really kind of give them some specific kind of um, suggestions to help them besides all the other mentors that might be available to them. So I just kind of throw that out there. It might be somebody from another um, program nearby. John, or this is Clyde. Can everyone hear me? Uh, yep, we can hear I'd you. Like first, okay, I'd like to first address this from experience that I've had. You know, my experience in hiring, hiring technical teachers is somewhat local, but also very occupation specific. There are occupations such as the healthcare, nursing field, et cetera, that become very competitive because of critical shortages that exist in the general economy. In addition, when you look at certain schools and specific occupations, such as some of the technical occupations, you find it very difficult sometimes for schools to compete with the existing salary structures that are being paid in business and industry. But saying all that, there's the occupational advisory committees tend to be a great source to find some people who may be interested in a career change that may not necessarily come to the school for an increase in salary, but looking for a lifestyle change and obviously want to pass on some of those experiences they've learned on the job and their own life experiences in the occupation. So we're going to take a few more questions here before we sign off. And one of them um, is, what are you, if you have any recommendations, um, how would you retain qualified teachers? Anyone want to take that question? Should we move on to the next? Sorry, Claude, do you want to address that one first? Yes. Uh, you know, retaining occupants. Uh, highly qualified teachers, it's really about the process. It's no different than when you talk about engagement strategies for your occupational advisory committee. Administrators and school leaders need to have engagement strategies and recognize the accomplishments of their teachers. Uh, hopefully uh, the, the salary schedules are rewarding, uh, the ability to continue their education and the benefit schedule. Uh, teaching is a great profession. Uh, but it does have rewards, and those rewards tend to be focused around the achievement of the students. So it is, it is a challenge, and it's primarily focusing on those people who want to make teaching their profession. And profession, for all of us, tends to be a lot longer than just a job change from year to year. So again, I would think that a lot of this comes back to the leadership of the individuals and the recognition of the accomplishments of those teachers and, and the rewards that some schools set up. Yeah, if I, if I could just add, too, you know, we all remember the marshmallow experiment, you know, where the, the students, uh, you know, have a marshmallow placed in front of them and there's delayed gratification. You know, CTE teaching is a lot like that in terms of the teacher being the one who may get delayed gratification. You know, I, I can remember multiple times when I was a teacher that um, I would be uh, met, you know, in the community by one of my past students. and they would give me as a teacher accolades for um, some of the things they learned in the classroom and how it's helped them and how they remembered it and that kind of thing. 
And I'll tell you, the first time that kind of experience happens to you, it just makes your passion for the uh, for the the field of education, in particular CTE education, grow all the more. But you know that 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 gratification is usually delayed till after you've been in the business for three or four years and you've had a couple graduating seniors. So it's important, uh, you know, as Clyde just mentioned, you know, that you that each school provides some mechanism of mentorship, of rewards and things like that so that until you get to that point where you're experiencing gratification from work that you've actually done, um, you know, you have at least some people who can help you uh, understand this, this new profession that you've entered. Yeah, one more note, John. I would think that, you know, as teachers begin their teaching career and they start to work with the mentor and the senior administrator to think about how they would plan their own career progression. So it, it just isn't the act of necessarily teaching, which can be a tremendous or rewarding occupation, but for those that want to continue and move on in their occupation, and, and that's part of what Book 3 talks about, how you engage, and it's a lot of self-rewarding and self-fulfillment in becoming a teacher leader or an education leader or possibly at the state and national level to be engaged as a leader in current technical education. Perfect. Thank you so much. So I know that we are almost done. We have one more question that if um, our panelists can just answer briefly, I think would be fantastic. Um, so the last question we have here is, are there supplementary activities that are recommended if this book were to be used as a part of a professional development activity? Uh, just briefly, uh, when we went over the layout of the book, there are resources at the end of each chapter. In fact, uh, Pam mentioned some of those resources, um, one of them in, in specific. Um, and I know, I, I don't know if Michael is uh, still in the room, Michael Connor from ACTE, but we've had discussions about putting sections of the book uh, online and, and those sorts of things. So the, the short answer is there are resources at the end of each chapter. Uh, that we provided that, um, though it's not a supplement to the book, there are things there that, um, you know, can be uh, can be helpful to people planning mentorship programs or to the new teacher themselves. And there have been discussions about um, a bit of an online resource. Um, so, Leah, I don't know if Michael's still in the room and he wants to address that or not, but... Uh, yep, he's just... right here. Hi, John, and, and thank you for bringing that up. And uh, also correlated to... Uh, Pam's comments uh, about mentorship and, and networking. I, again, I just want to remind everyone that uh, later or early this spring, later this month, we'll be announcing the launch of the core community as an online space for a community of practice for career and technical educators. That space will be fully available to HD members and will contain a number of resources that are directed towards the professional development of our community. Contained there will also be the opportunity to network and collaborate with other uh, affiliated uh, individuals in your sectors or clusters. And so we're excited about being able to launch that. We'll be notifying our membership through our weekly ACT news and other communications and hope to see you online. Um, and we are working with NACD to explore the possibility of bringing more of the resource from the book into a space that can support your professional development. So thank you for the question and thank you for thinking of it, John. Perfect. Okay, so we are just about at our hour. So I want to thank everyone again who was able to join us for this presentation. Um, we greatly appreciate all of your comments. I know we didn't get to all of your questions, but on the screen now you should see the contact information for all of our panelists and also for ACT and NOCTI if you want to check out our website. We look forward to having you on the call for future online seminars. Thank you so much again and have a great day everyone.